Thank you so much, Ed. I, I am, uh, could we have the lights on so I can see people? That would be nice. I hate to play to the dark. And I want to thank everybody at St. Francis for this wonderful honor of giving me an honorary doctorate today. Uh, an honorary doctorate from St. Francis would be, huh? Not a doctorate? Lunch? I came here for lunch? They told me it was a doctorate. It's lunch. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> I got to tell you, the, the emotions that are just swimming through this, this body of mine. By the way, I weigh the same now as I did when I was at St. Francis. A lot of people talk about gaining weight. I didn't. I'm still the same. But the emotions that have gone through me coming back to this building, which was so important to me, and the, the relationships, the friends, my dear friend Joe Campanero, my dear friend Ed Satrakian, who I've known for 40 years, and we're still friends. So keep your friends very close, because 40 years from now, which are going to go by like that, uh, I hope they are still your friends, still your confidence. You know, it's it, funny. I, before a show, I am absolutely not nervous. I have never been so frightened in my life to come back here and talk to you guys today. So please, bear with me. I, I do have a lot of stage fright right now. Uh, I, I really do. Because I have to be myself. You know, on stage I can hide behind zero. I can hide behind a character. But here I, I have to be me. And, uh, you know, me is, meh, who cares. But as I went down the, the, uh, the building today, I didn't remember the building, it's changed so much, but what I remembered, and I think what you will remember, are the wonderful people, the teachers that I had here, dear Brother Leo, do you remember Brother Leo? Brother Leo was my math teacher, and he called me into his office one day and he said, Jimmy, you have absolutely no uh, aptitude for mathematics. And I said, you're telling me. I said, I know that. He passed me out of the goodness of his heart. He really did. He said, you know, I've seen you on this stage, and you're not going to be a mathematician. Do you mind taking a D? And I said, a D? That's fabulous. I'd love to have a D. That'd be great. Um, and then Brother Giles. Brother Giles was a man I will never forget. He was my Shakespeare teacher. And uh, he, he brought the characters to life. He, do you remember Giles? He was just, he was bigger than life, Brother Giles Turby. And about uh, 10 years ago, a little package arrived in the mail. And I opened it, and it was a picture of a, a Shakespearean actor drawing a sword. And Giles wrote me this note saying, um, I don't know how much longer I have. This is my favorite picture, and I've had it for 50 years, and I want you to have it now. And that's still on my wall. Wall. There was a guy here named Dr. Wall, and this man I despised. He was a dick. No, his name was Dick Wall. Richard Wall. And, oh, you thought I meant, oh. Well, I did, but anyway. He, he actually failed me. He had the nerve to fail me. It was uh, an English seminar. And he was, he was very, very full of himself. He just very, very <laughs> And he said, gentlemen, do you realize, he was all guys back then. He said, gentlemen, do you realize that sugar is the only word in the English language where the S-U is pronounced with an H sound? Sugar. And I just said, are you sure? Failed, <laughs> out, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> you know, I, I made a couple of uh, notes um, because I, I wanted to talk about the journey from here to there. I, how many of you are actors and, and want to pursue acting as a profession? That's great. That's great. I hope you have the passion for it. Because somebody once asked me, what would you do if you weren't an actor? And, and I had no answer. I mean, there, there are some people like Marion Seldes, who's a wonderful actress, and she said, acting is oxygen to me. 
to be on the stage, you know? And, and when you're doing a show, I tell you, you start the first thing in the morning and you're gearing up for eight o'clock that night and your whole day is geared towards that performance. So it, it really is a, a, you know, a very dedicated life. Now, I've been really lucky. When I first started out, I thought I wanted to be a priest or a Franciscan brother uh, because I liked uh, the comfort of the clothes. It was really good. When I was 13 years old, see, not only I knew I was going to be in religion, I knew I was going to be the first Brooklyn-born pope. I would practice coming out on the balcony of St. Peter's and wave my arms. But then when I was 13 years old, my father introduced me to his friend, Ethel Merman. Does anybody remember who Ethel Merman was? Oh, good. I'm very happy to hear that, because a lot of people, she's, she's gone the way of a lot of the Broadway performers uh, because she didn't do a whole lot of film or television work. But when I saw her in Gypsy, which I had committed a mortal sin that day because Gypsy had been condemned by the Catholic Church. So I knew I was going to burn in hell, but I went anyway. <laughs> and we met Ethel Merman on the stage afterwards. And anybody who had asked me, what are you going to be when you grow up? I would always say, I'm going to be a priest. And then on the stage of the Broadway theater, 20th of June, 1959, I was brought out by my dad, and Ethel's father was there too. And uh, she said, what are you going to be when you grow up? And at that moment, the curtain of the Broadway theater rose. And there was this dark, empty Broadway theater, and I was standing with the queen of musical comedy. And I said, I'm going to be an actor. And at that moment, I knew I was speaking the truth. And it, it, it was a wonderful, wonderful time. I started working right away. In fact, John Clifford, uh, who was the moderator of the Troopers, uh, was, would pick a show for me to, to star in. One of the shows he picked was The Odd Couple, that I would play Oscar. And so we were all excited about this. And then I got an audition for an off-Broadway show called Endicott and the Red Cross. And I went to John and I said, it's an off-Broadway show. And he said, well, you have to take it. So they did The Odd Couple, I think, with Kevin Farrell. Uh, Kevin O'Farrell. Now, the odd thing about this is the show I auditioned for, it was called Endicott and the Red Cross, produced by the American Place Theater and written by the then Poet Laureate of the United States, who was Robert Lowell. And this man was certifiable. He was absolutely the craziest human being I have ever met in my life. The funny part about it, it was at the theater at St. Clement's where I played soldier number three, and now I'm back at the theater at St. Clement's as zero. So I've worked my way up from three to zero. The, the, the one thing that I never wanted to be, and it, it's funny, was famous. I met a lot of famous people, and as a, a writer, see, I have two careers. The stage is where I, I love. But the writing is the other side of me. There's really two different sides of me. There's the public side where I love to just be on the stage and act. And then there's the private side where I just like to be at my typewriter, my computer now, and write. So I, I was very blessed to have met some wonderful people. Uh, and I saw the two sides of fame. So when I ask you if you want to be an actor, that's great. And the other thing is, hello? See, my phone plays Ethel Merman. It's true, it really does. So, um, oh, sure. Oh, sure. Out, you're in detention now. <clears throat> One of the plays that I wrote was a play called The Lucky O'Learys. And I thought it would be very good for Katherine Hepburn. Now, I met Katherine Hepburn when she was doing Coco in New York, and uh, after the performance, a friend of mine who was in the show said, come back and meet Miss Hepburn. I, I thought, wonderful, I'd love to meet Miss Hepburn. So I went backstage, and I'm standing next to Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet. Do these names mean anything to anybody? Yeah, okay. But they were a singing team. So I'm standing there, and Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet are standing next to me. The stage manager knocks on the door and the door opens, and you could just see the, cr the, the side of Hepburn's face. And the stage manager said, Miss Hepburn, would you say hello to Steve and Edie? And she opened the door and she said, hello, Steve and Edie, and closed the door. 
So now I figured, what am I going to get? Well, instead, I got invited to go to another actor's house, and Miss Hepburn came, and we, we stayed up for hours talking, and, and the thing that really struck me about this wonderful patrician woman was her laugh, that she kind of... <coughs> she had this snort, but it was wonderful. She had this deep, deep laugh. So fade away to about six months later, and I'm doing a show up at the Goodspeed Opera House in uh, East Haddam, Connecticut. It was a show called Something's Afoot. So I was the first one on the stage, and the, the curtain was down, and I heard this rumbling out in the audience, and I peeked through the hole, and here was Catherine Hepburn coming to see the show. The stage manager said, Miss Hepburn would like to see you afterwards. I said, wonderful. So she came backstage, and she looked at me, and the first thing she said was, do you remember me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I might remember you. And she invited me down to her house in Fenwick, uh, which was on Long Island Sound, and it was incredible. Here was a house that I knew she and Spencer Tracy had spent so much time in, and there were sporting equipment everywhere, and sleds, and tennis rackets, and golf clubs, and, and a fire, and she loved to have the fire. This was the middle of August, and it was hot, and she still had a fire. With every thing that was on a table, like if she had a lamp on a table, it was attached by a very small wire or a string to the ceiling. And I couldn't figure this out, so finally, I, I, she allowed me to call her Kate, and, and I said, Kate, why is these strings on all these lamps and things? And she said, I clean myself. And she knocked the lamp out of the way, and she pretended she was dusting, and then the lamp just settled back <laughs> and while she was on to the next table. She said, it saves so much time, and time is all we have, isn't it? And that's the one thing I want you to remember today, if you remember anything. It's time is all we have, and use your time wisely. <clears throat> as I said, the other part of my life was as a playwright. So I wrote a play called The Lucky O'Learys, and I called Kate, and uh, she said, I'll read it, and she did. She said, it's very funny, but I'm totally miscast in this. She said, call Lucille. I said, ball? She said, yes. I said, well, do you have her number? No. Hung up. <laughs> that was the way she was. She was just very, you know, she wasn't abrupt. She was just very businesslike. So I thought, now, how do I get in touch with Lucille Ball? Do you know who Lucille Ball was? Okay, good. We're on the right track now. So, <clears throat> couldn't figure it out. I called a lot of people who had worked with her. They didn't know her address. I went down to Hollywood Boulevard, and I got a Maps to the Stars Homes. And there was Lucille Ball, 1000 North Roxbury Drive. I put the script in a manila envelope, and also I told her that I had taken a comedy class with her in 1977. She gave a seminar. Uh, at the Hollywood, uh, the, the uh, Community College of Hollywood, and it was terrific. She would, it was a six-week course, and she would sit in the front, and she would just take questions, and so we were all prepared with questions. So in this note, I wrote two things. I said, here's the play. Kate Hepburn thought she'd be very good in it. I went to your comedy class in 1977, and I played backgammon, because I knew she was a backgammon freak. Two days later, the phone rang. Hello? Jim? Yeah? This is Lucy. Well, if you don't think, that gives you a start. And she said, uh, can you come over and talk about the script? She liked it. She said, you made me laugh for the first time in two years. And she was actually looking to do a project with Audrey Meadows. And this was about two sisters of a certain age. And I said, well, this is perfect. So I went over to meet Lucille Ball. And I knock on the front door, and she opened the door herself, all in white. And she was my idol. Anything I learned about comedy, I learned from this woman, and watching her, and studying her. And there she was right in front of me. So we went to the back house to play backgammon and talk about the script. So she sat down in one chair, and I sat down in the other chair opposite her. And crack, I broke the chair. The ball of the leg came right off. Now, I didn't know whether to freeze for the next two hours or however long I was going to be there, or just to own up to the fact I had just broken her chair. I said, Miss Ball. She said, Lucy, call me Lucy. I said, Lucy, I just broke your chair. 
She said, we'll get another one. Oh, okay, that's easy. I went over and I got the second chair. Sat in that. Crack. <laughs> now I've broken two chairs in two minutes. I said, why don't I take that chair? That one looks sturdy. She said, the other two look sturdy too. <laughs> so now I'm sweating bullets. She tried to tell me a joke, which I cannot repeat here because it was filthy. <laughs> and she screwed it up. And she said something at the end of the joke, and I said something to her which was a leap of faith. It was something one person should not say to a great legend after meeting them for the first time. And when I said this, she fell on the floor laughing. And I mean, she screamed laughing, and I said, don't die, I don't want to be in the Enquirer next week, I want my play produced. So she sat back down, and we started talking. And we talked, and we talked, and we talked about everything but the play. And we bonded that afternoon. So five hours later, uh, her husband Gary Morton came home, and they had to go out, and, and we still hadn't done any business. So she said to me, well, can you come back tomorrow? And I said, yes, but tomorrow's my birthday. So if I come back, you have to give me a present. She said, maybe I'll give you a chair. <laughs> the next day I came back and we started talking again. Halfway through our backgammon game, she went to the corner and she came back with a little uh, foil covered box. It was covered in green foil with a little card on it, and she started singing happy birthday. And I started to cry. And she said, what are you crying for? And I said, well, did Lucille Ball ever sing happy birthday to you? <laughs> I opened up the little box, and it wasn't a chair. It was this watch, which has not been off my wrist in 20 years, and she gave it to me. I'll show it to you later if you like. Her little face is on here. And the note said, dear Jim, I will always have time for you. And from that day, I spent every single day with Lucille Ball. And she told me the story of her life over the backgammon table. But the point I, I want to make about Lucille Ball is fame being a two-edged sword. And the other great star that I got to know, here we go again, I'm keeping my fingers crossed, Joan Crawford. Mean anything? Joan was an Academy Award winner. She was a huge star in the, in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. She, she made a huge comeback with a, a movie called Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Well, when I was 13 years old, my father, it was, my mother died when I was very young, so my father would give me these wonderful experiences and one of them was a cruise. So we took this cruise to South America and a man came running in at the, the Bon Voyage party and said, do you know who's down, Joan Crawford's on the ship. And my father just went crazy. And I said, well, who's Joan Crawford? Who's Joan Crawford? She's the greatest actress. She's my most favorite actress in the world. I said, well, uh, I don't know who she is. And he said, well, you, you'll, you'll get to know her. I, I have to meet her. I have to meet her. So the next day, there was a mixer for the teenagers on the ship. And I went to it, and I met these twin girls who were my age. And we had a wonderful time. She said, well, do you want to come back to our stateroom? And we have some games there. And I said, well, great. So I went back and met their mother, who was this very beautiful lady who was sitting at the dressing table dyeing her hair. I'll never forget that. She was dyeing her hair. She was in a robe. She, uh, we, we spent about th three hours with her, and I'm trying to now set her up with my father, even though I don't know who this is. But I was always trying to make a match for my father. Uh, you know, any single woman, any widow. And so I came back and I said, Daddy, I met this beautiful woman. He said, I'm not interested. I'm not getting married again. I don't care what you tell me, what you do. I'm not getting married again. I said, okay, fine. That night at dinner, my father and I are sitting against a banquette. And from the beginning, from the, from the doorway of the dining room, we hear applause. And the applause starts to grow. And it's Crawford with the two daughters, and people are now giving her a standing ovation. And I'm watching her come in, and my father is going, that's her. There's Crawford. It's Joan. Huh? And she came over to the table, and she said, oh, Jimmy, how nice of you to spend the afternoon with us. And she looked at my father, and she said, and you must be Pete. 
And at that moment, he turned into Ralph Cramden. Crawford. She said, well, we'll have a drink and a dance, won't we later, Pete? Well, they, be they began a three-year affair. They did, a three-year affair, and Joan and I were, were very close. But one night I went up to visit her to tell her I was going to be an actor. And the first thing she said to me was, you're too tall. I don't know what that meant, but I was too tall. Uh, uh, she, she had a babushka and a house coat, no makeup, and she was making stew for a party she was giving the next night, and a, a pizza commercial came on. And uh, I said, she said, oh, it'd be great to go out and get a pizza. And I said, well, let's go. And she said, I can't. I said, why? She said, it would take me two hours to get ready. I said, to do what? She said, don't you understand? I cannot leave the house unless I am Joan Crawford. And I thought that was really sad, that fame being that two-edged sword that she couldn't really leave the house unless she was her. Now, that's very, very different today. You know, and Lucy was very different. If Lucy saw the pizza commercial, we'd throw on some, she'd throw on some lipstick and out we'd go. I would not throw on the lipstick, she would. You know, but fame is a two-edged sword. And that's why I wanted to be an actor, but I really never wanted to be famous. And uh, it's catching up with me, and it's a little, you know, what am I trying to say? You, you lose something. You, you lose something. But uh, anybody who wants to be an actor, go for it. Because it's the most rewarding career. You will meet some of the great people of the, of the world. I mean, uh, my life has been so blessed to have known some of the most fascinating people of the 20th century. And it was all because I wanted to be an actor. I, I would love to take questions. I, I really, the, the only part I played, I, I actually took a couple of years off. When I, I live in Los Angeles. And I actually took a couple of years off to produce and direct. I ran a theater out there. And I was a lousy producer. No, truly, producers have to be mean people. And they have to be able to say no. And I can't say no. And, and so uh, it, it, was, it was not a good match. The only thing I did about producing Zero Hour is I got the producing team together. These are relationships that I've built over the last 30 years. And Kurt Peterson, who is the lead producer, was a dear friend of mine. He would produced three or four Broadway shows. And Ed Gaines, who was the other producer, produced The Big Voice, uh, my last off-Broadway show. So I put them together because I thought they would be a very good team, and they have turned out to be an excellent team. So the only thing I really had, uh, and I, I have some friends who uh, have a little money, and when we said we were going to do this, they invested. So I brought some money to the table, and I brought the team to the table, and uh, thank God the reviews have been over the top, just over the top, wonderful. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to tell you is that we are closing Sunday at the theater at St. Clement's, but business has been so good, we found another theater. So I'm going to get uh, in touch with Dennis, and I'll be able to offer the, uh, the students of St. Francis a very, very cheap ticket, all right, if you want to come see it. And if you do come see it, please come back and say hello afterwards. When I was growing up, I had a mentor, and his name was David Burns. And Davey was a wonderful Broadway actor. He started his Broadway career in 1922 with a show called Polly Preferred. And then he was the original mayor in The Music Man, the original Senex in Forum, the original Vandegelder in Dolly. He was in The Price. And in fact, I brought Davey here uh, when I was a, a senior to do what I'm doing with you. And he came with Kate Reed, who was also his co-star in Arthur Miller's The Price at that time. Now, Davy was doing a play called Do Re Mi with Phil Silvers. And that's when I first got to know him. And then when he moved to uh, Forum, uh, I went to see a funny thing happened on the way to the Forum. Now, I was still in high school. And I went to a place called LaSalle Military Academy out in Oakdale, Long Island. And here I was, this fat kid in a West Point uniform. So after the show, Zero, well, first of all, Zero came out, and I have never felt a, a presence 
in the theater, like Zero Mostel. He came bursting through the curtains, and you can almost feel yourself go back in the chair. He, he was just something else, and I mean, this was one of the funniest human beings I'd ever seen in my life. So, after the show, I went backstage to see Davy. And Davy's dressing room was this way, but the stage was that way. So I would always go and sneak out onto a Broadway stage, just to be able to stand there. So I came this way, I made a turn, and bang! Ran smack, literally smack into Zero Mostel. And he was still in his costume, he was soaking wet. It was like he had just stepped in a shower in this costume. So he looked at me in my military uniform, and he said, Who are you, General Nuisance? <laughs> I, I mean, I couldn't speak. What are you doing here? I said, well, I, I came to see my friend Davy Burns. Well, you never come to see me. I said, well, I can. He said, well, you'd better. So whenever I went to see Davy, I would always hang out with Zero when I was 14. Then when I went to uh, college, and, and you, you, these visits were, were wonderful, and, and some of the, the greatest stars in the world would come visit Zero, and I would just sit there like a, a motion picture going on in front of me. Then uh, when I started to be an actor, uh, my first show was in 1969. And I, well, when I was in college, I had a roommate, and he knew he was going to grow up to be the great Broadway composer of all time, and we all said, yeah, right. He knew Maria Carnilova, who was playing Golda in Fiddler on the Roof. And he said, I can introduce you to her. And I said, well, I can better that. I can introduce you to Zero Mostel. So he and I flew to New York for the second performance of Fiddler on the Roof. His name was Stephen Schwartz. I don't know what ever happened to him. He wrote something called Wicked. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in, in fact, he came to the show the other night, and he's, he's still a very dear friend of mine. So, and Zero, Zero was so wonderful after the show to both of us. Then when I first became an actor, I ran into him at the corner of 50th Street and Broadway. And I said, Z, I'm an actor. I'll be the judge of that. I said, well, I wish you would be because I'm in a show. I want you to come see it. Why would I want to do that? Why would I waste my time? And I said, well, then you don't, but I, I said, if you don't come to see the show, what I want more than anything else, would you give me an autographed picture of yourself? And here he is on the corner of 50th Street and Broadway with his cane, and he said, you're not worthy! And walked away. Two nights later, the stage manager came backstage and said, Lou Jacoby and Zero Mostel are out front. And I thought, well, that's all I needed to hear. My friend Lou stayed, and, and Zero left. And I thought, well, he hated the show. But two nights later, I came, and there was a manila envelope on my table. And I opened it to Jimmy with my admiration, Zero, which is still on my wall at home. So he had a huge influence on my life. And then when I started to read about him and the obstacles that he went through, I mean, he, he survived the blacklist you know, which was in the 50s, where all these actors and directors and writers lost their livelihoods, and he survived a bus accident where his leg was, was almost amputated. Um, Larry Gelbart, the wonderful Larry Gelbart, who wrote MASH, he and I did a radio interview together about Zero, and they said to him, what would have happened if Zero had had his leg amputated? And Larry said he would have grown another one. And that's the kind of force of nature that Zero was. He was a really larger-than-life character. And sadly, he died at the age of 62. He was, he was trying out a new show in Philadelphia, and he had a ruptured aorta, which was the same thing that happened to Lucy that she died of. And everybody said he was absolutely brilliant in the one performance he gave of The Merchant, which was a, uh, a retake and updating of The Merchant of Venice. And, um, and he died at the age of 62. So when I started to approach that age, I thought, hmm, this could be my next project, because uh, I think it would be fun to be zero. And it is fun to be zero. It really is. I think it's this. I think it's this, because I'm on stage for two hours all by myself. And, and the part that I miss most about being an actor is working with other actors. Uh, I, I don't know if you know about this thing called Project Shaw. It's open to the public. It's at the Players Club on uh, Gramercy Park. And uh, they, they do a reading once a month of a Shaw play with a first-class cast. And, uh, and I've been very privileged to, 
do one and I'm going to do another one in February. But I long to work with other actors again. You know, it can be very lonely up there. Uh, but I think that's the challenge is to get out there and to save your voice. And because Zero does a lot of yelling uh, in the show. He was, as, you know, he was an angry man. So I think this is the biggest challenge of them all. There was a, a show I had to learn a guitar, and that was a terrible challenge, but it was a terrible show. No, it was, no, it was just a oh, god-awful show. It was my second off-Broadway show called To Be or Not To Be, What Kind of a Question Is That? And I had to come running out on stage with this guitar and jump up on a box and sing this god-awful song about the lamb and the wolf and the parakeet or whoever. It was just awful. Opening night. I came running out on stage, went for the box, missed it, the box flipped, the guitar went this way, my head hit the stage. I saw stars. You, you talk about seeing stars. I saw stars. Next day in the New York Times, Clive Barnes, who was then the critic for the Times, wrote, you've heard of a play within a play. Last night we saw a flop within a flop. <laughs> so that could, that could have been challenging too, but I think it's zero. To me, acting is a way to escape yourself. You know, it's very interesting to find the traits of other people. If you're an actor, observe people. That's, that's my charge to you. Observe people. Observe their idiosyncrasies, the way they use their hands. You know, using your hands is it's such an important part of acting. You know, I, I see actors who just indicate everything and said, well, I think that you, you know, it's... <laughs> Just, you, you should be so into the role and so into the part that everything just happens. You know, I, I have been thrown, as I said, I went to Carnegie Tech. And I went to Carnegie Tech first before I came to St. Francis to learn how to be an actor. I got thrown out of every acting class because I don't think you really can be taught it. I think you can be taught technique and tricks to keep it fresh every night. I mean, now I'm, I'm in my 300th performance of zero and my job is to keep it as fresh for this audience as it was for the audience the night before. And sometimes you just don't want to do it. You know, you get to the theater and you just say, oh God, do I have to do this again? But then I think, I'm not down in a coal mine for 10 hours a day. I'm not a yak driver in Afghanistan. I am lucky. I am blessed to be able to go out on a stage and entertain people for two hours. So in, in what you're saying, I think you bring a great deal of yourself to every role. I think there was a lot of me in Zero and vice versa, but um, y there was enough of a difference that I can be normal during the day and not spread butter on my arm, you know, as he would do in a restaurant. He was just outrageous. Yes, I love the stage. I love the stage. The camera to me, and I, I only recently got used to, um, to, to doing sitcoms. Uh, I mean, the camera to me is a big eye, and they're two very different mediums. I, I'm, in fact, I'm a little concerned about tonight. The Lincoln Center Library has chosen the show to add to its archives. So there's going to be cameras there tonight, along with the audience. So it's, it's, it, it really kind of is strange. When you are an actor in a play, and the rehearsals are done, you are in control out there. You're the pilot. You're the bus driver. And it's up to you to keep the, the bus straight and on the road and to deliver to the end. TV and film, they're in charge. They're all in charge. The cameramen are in charge. The director is in charge. And you're, you're really more of a pawn. But the trick I had to learn in doing television was to forget that the camera was there. Just totally forget it was there and do it like a play. Norman is a very dear man, a very smart man. And he was smart enough to just kind of be around. He, he didn't say much. He would welcome you. He would, uh, you know, he, he was kind of like the pater familias. He would be around, be very generous, very gregarious. But he wasn't really a hands-on producer. He gave that over to the people within the show. But he would always come for, like, the, uh, the run-through and see what was going on. And he would give notes. Uh, usually they weren't much. The, uh, the episodes I, were involved, I was involved in was the Christmas tree murders. I, I wish it, is it on DVD? Did, do you know if that season is on? Because I'd loved, I was really cute back then. 
I think it was the second or third. Well, it was the Christmas tree murders, and I worked with Marty Mull, and I was office of Jerry Chandler. And I'm not great at improvisation. I'm really not. I like to have a script in front of me. But Louise Lasser, who played Mary, oh, she was the best. She was just great. And we would start with the script, and the next thing I knew, we were someplace else. But, and you'd go with her. You know, the art of improv is to say yes, is to keep accepting what the other character is telling you and building on that. So uh, the, the days of Mary Hartman were just joyful. Um, there was an actress named Dodie Goodman, and Dodie played Mary Hartman's mother. Well, Dodie was a very strange, very sweet, but a very strange lady who memorized the entire script. Not just her lines, she would memorize the entire script. So if you had a line, she would be mouthing the line. <laughs> and then she'd take a breath, and she'd tell you her line, because she was a little ditzy like this, and then you'd start and she'd... <laughs> Which was very disconcerting, but the camera wasn't on her, but here I'm watching her mouth my lines. <laughs> Shut up. I, I was very lucky growing up in Bay Ridge you know, the theater kind of came to me. I didn't go to the theater. And what I mean by that is we had a theater in our apartment house. Uh, it was a 300-seat theater. And a lot of the off-Broadway shows would come and try out there, and then there was a community theater there, uh, a resident company there. So all I had to do was take the elevator downstairs, and I was at a theater. And I, I would hang out there. And then after I saw Ethel Merman, I went back to that theater and I, I rented it for a night and I got all the kids in the neighborhood together and we put on a show and we raised like $300 for the Cancer Society and of course I was the star. But I gave the other kids good parts too. I was 13 years old, yeah. Wrote, wrote produced, directed. I was Orson Welles. <laughs> yeah, well you, there, there was a time, Kate, as you know, the actor-manager. You know, William Gillette, Edwin Booth, they, they all would select shows for themselves and they would also produce them and then take them on the road. That doesn't happen as much anymore. But to be an actor, you cannot wait for something to happen. You know, a, a man will write a play, a woman will write a play, and there's ten parts, five parts in it, maybe you're right for one of the parts. But maybe 200 other actors are also just as right for the part. So you're competing against them. I learned about 20 years ago that I had a talent to write, and that if I was going to write, I could write for myself. And that's what I started to do. And then, I, I, just being in the business for so long, I, I've gotten to know these wonderful people who have become great supporters, who will contribute money, who will invest. Although investing in theater nowadays is more like philanthropy. It's not investing, you know. You, you have to be prepared to throw your money away. Um, you know, people do get lucky sometimes, but I think if I had any lesson to tell an actor, it's to be the master of their own fate, to do as much for yourself as you can and not wait for somebody to write a part for you. Find a character, go into history, find somebody that you're like, find out about them. Start with a monologue. You know, have, have your monologues ready, have, have your audition pieces ready, uh, but make sure that they're really good for you. Um, and then expand on that. And then it becomes an annuity. You know, like Ed said before, there's Hal Holbrook, and he did Mark Twain for years. He started Mark Twain. Uh, I don't know if you remember Charles Nelson Riley. He was a dear friend of mine. Now, he went to school with Hal Holbrook, and he was sitting next to him one day, 1951, and Hal had a paper bag. And he looked in it, and, and Charles said, what's that? He said, there was a wig in there, there was a coat with a velvet collar. There was a bow tie. And that was his costume for Mark Twain. And Charles said, but what Hal didn't know was also in that bag was the Emmy, the Tony, and the Grammy. So start with a dream and expand on it. Get yourself a paper bag and put wonderful things in it for yourself. And you may end up with a Tony or an Emmy in there too. That there's more no's than yeses, and that you can't take it personally, and that you, 
you need to keep the end game in your head of where you want to be at a, at a certain place. And I'm very lucky. I'm really one of the very lucky ones who have managed to get where I wanted to go. And I, and I have escaped fame, which I really didn't want in the first place. But what I love, and uh, you know, we have very dear friends, and they said, do you know every famous person in the world knows who you are? And I thought, well, isn't that better? Isn't that better than to be famous, that the famous know you? As I said, I think w w had I had known back then to get myself a paper bag and to start doing for myself, I think that would have been the greatest lesson. But I didn't learn that until about 20 years ago. But you live, you learn. I think it's this one. I really think it's this one. I, I have pretty much loved every show I have done, except for the one where I fell on the box. <laughs> that, that was truly awful. It was just really awful, awful, but you have to make the best out of it. You have to think this material is golden and go out and play it like it's golden. But uh, I have such joy uh, of doing Zero Hour, and I have the, the joy of so many people who have known Zero have come backstage uh, to say hello. His, his relatives have all come, uh, which was wonderful. Uh, it, in Florida, it was the last performance I did, but I got to my dressing table and it said, Bennett Mostel and the entire Mostel family is here tonight. I would rather have heard that afterwards than before. It doesn't help with concentration. But they all loved the show. And uh, the people who worked with Zero, who are still alive, who have been coming backstage, saying that I have reopened a whole era and a whole time for them, um, that, that makes me very happy. So I, I think not only is Zero the most fun to do, but it's also the most rewarding. It's had the, the biggest ramifications. The, the one thing I will tell you, because it's kind of public, uh, I'm, I'm usually ready to go on at half hour. My makeup is done, my costume is on, I'm ready to go. And I spend that half hour either visiting with the stage managers who I love, or I do my crossword puzzle. I always do a crossword puzzle before I go on because it takes me out of myself. And it, it, keeps, it prevents me from thinking about the show. Because if I start thinking about the show, I'll go nuts. And I just rely on, on the gods that I will know what the next line is coming out. And thank God it usually works. So that's, that's my pre-ritual is I do a crossword. Interesting, Josh Mostel is uh, Zero's son. They had a very fractured relationship. Um, Josh uh, is an actor in his own right. It's funny because Zero always called himself a painter rather than an actor. Uh, he said, I'm a painter who just does comedy to buy more paint. Uh, and he, he always thought of himself as kind of moonlighting as an actor. And it's funny, Zero had two children. One became an actor and the other became a painter. Now, I, I knew Josh slightly. So when I first had the idea to do this and when I first wrote the play, I thought he's the first person I want to tell. Because I know if somebody wrote a play about my father, I'd, I wouldn't want to read about it in the paper first. So I wrote him an email, and I said, I've written this. And he wrote back and he said, why? And I, and I said, because your father's a great character. You know? And he never called him my father. It was always zero. So uh, he said, yeah, send me the play. So I sent him the play, and he had two notes. One was, uh, I had used the word capish. And he said, Zero never would have said Capish. And uh, I talk about the great Roman playwright Titus Machius Plautus. And he said, and you spelled Plautus wrong. <laughs> and those were the only two notes he had. And he said, other than that, it's historically accurate. I mean, th this is a boy who was, Zero was disowned by his Jewish family for marrying a Catholic girl. And on Zero's mother's deathbed, he brought Josh to meet his grandmother for the first time. And the grandmother rejected them and died. I mean, this is what this boy had to live with all these years. So, and, um, and then I wrote to him, Zero's great enemy, which I talk about, was a director named Jerry Robbins, Jerome Robbins, the great Jerome Robbins. But he had named names to the House on American Activities Committee, so Zero hated him for doing that. And then they were forced to work together not only in Forum, but in Fiddler on the Roof. And about 1980, I was crossing the street in front of Lincoln Center. 
and there was a very big guy and a little guy. And I heard Kate and my mother and disown, and I looked, and it was Josh Mostel with Jerry Robbins. And so I, <laughs> I came as close to them as I could. So I wrote Josh back, and I said, do you remember that by any chance? And he wrote me a very long email that he remembered crossing the street that day with Jerry Robbins. And uh, how Robbins had then, after Zero died, Robbins turned to Josh to do a part in uh, Robin's new piece, which was called the Papa piece, which was about getting rid of his guilt for naming names. And um, so that, that's the contact I've had with Josh. I know he doesn't want to see it. I know that. I, I always feel, I think I feel more in control on stage than I do in real life. You know, everything happens around you in real life. On stage, you know what's going to happen. You know, that phone is going to ring when I say this word. You, you hope it's going to ring when I say this word. But, but no, I don't think I've ever gotten that lost in a character um, that I've lost myself. I, I've always known. Only when you played yourself. Yeah, I don't play myself very well. No, that's true. <laughs>